So thanks, Santon. So good evening to everybody. First of all, I would like to thank Santon and Arion to organize a nice conference and for the invitation, of course. So I will mainly discuss about heavy quark dynamics in QCD matter. So this is an overview talk. I will discuss some of the recent update on some specific areas. So I think my slide is visible, is it? Yes, it's visible. Yes, yes. Thank you. So this is the outline. I will mainly discuss about heavy quark transport coefficient constraint from the experimental array and V2. Then I will discuss about heavy quark momentum evolution and hydronization. Then initial stage effect, mainly the electromagnetic field, tilted distributions, plasma, and finally, finally a summary and out. As we know, heavy quarks, mainly the charm and bottom quarks are considered as a novel proof of QGP because this heavy quark due to their large mass, they are produced at the very early stage of the heavy ion collisions. So they are the witness of the entire phase space evolution of uh, QGP. Also, the mass is much larger than the temperature of the system. So their the number remain almost conserved throughout the evolutions. Their relaxation time also much larger than the relaxation time of the QGP. So the propagation of heavy quark in QGP can be considered as the interaction between equilibrium and the non-equilibrium degrees of freedoms. And focal plank equation may provide an appropriate framework to study the heavy quark dynamics in QGP. So this is a kind of Brownian motion. So one can derive the focal plank equation starting from the Boltzmann equations. And in these Boltzmann equations, under the low momentum transfer, we can derive the focal plank equations. And in this focal plank equation, this AI and BIJ, these are the drag and diffusion coefficient, which really tell the microscopic detail how the heavy quark interact with the light quarks and gluons. And this focal plank equation can be recast to the Langevin dynamics where gamma is the drag coefficients and a, this is zeta is the stochastic force and a d is the diffusion coefficients, uh, which one need to calculate from different model or theory. And as we know, this heavy quark dynamics in QGP, it is a two component system. First of all, the heavy quark momentum will evolve in QGP and the QGP itself also evolve. So for the heavy quark momentum evolution, one may use a Langevin equation or Fokker plank or Boltzmann equations. For the bulk evolution, one may use a transport bulk or a hydrodynamics bulk. And this drag and diffusion coefficient, they are related by fluctuation dissipation theorem. Then to solve the transport coefficient, we need an initial condition. So to initialize the heavy quark in the coordinate space, people usually use this Galbert model. And for the momentum space, they usually use the next to leading order PQCD because we can really understand the dimension production in proton proton collision within the next to leading order PQCD. So in some sense, our initial condition is really constrained from the experimental side. So that's why these heavy quarks are really a good pro because we really know the initial condition conditions from the charm quark production in proton proton collisions. So then one can relate the solution of their transport equation to some of the experimental observable and we see what actually we really want to study at a different moment. So at the low momentum, we want to study the thermalization of heavy quark and really want to constrain the diffusion coefficient. That was the main motivations. And in the intermediate momentum, we want to study the hydronizations of the heavy quark and want to constrain the heavy quark wave function. And of course, at the high momentum, it is the jet, jet quenching parameter. But to study the heavy quark dynamics in RIC and LHC, starting from the production until it reach the detector, we really need several ingredients starting from the initial production, then the shadowing, then the pre-equilibrium phase, electromagnetic field, the tilted, that angular momentum, many. Then once it reached the QGP phase, then the heavy quark interact with the light quarks and the gluons there, we need the transport coefficients. Along with also we need the transport equation to study the heavy quark momentum evolutions. And once the temperature of the system reach below quark hydron transition temperature, then the heavy quark will eventually hydronize. 
and then for the hydronization one need either a coalescence or a fragmentation or a or a hybrid model of coalescence for fragmentation then again it will rescatter in the hadronic phase so as you can see there is a much more complex dynamics we really need several ingredients to have a realistic simulation to compare with the experimental data so of course there are several attempts from several groups around the globe since 2017 from the first experimental data but the simultaneous descriptions of the two experimental observable which they have measured in experiment one is the so called nuclear suppression factor and the other is the elliptic flow a simultaneous descriptions of both these observable is a top challenge to almost all the model and not only at rick energy it is almost the same at lc energy as well so as we can see this is the latest result for uh, lc at a colliding energy 5.02 tv so as we can see there are still a large uh, band of course there are several improvement over the year certainly there are improvement but still there are uncertainty so to compute this nuclear suppression factor as well as the elliptic flow we need transport coefficients as a input so this is one of the key parameter in the model to understand the heavy quark dynamics so as you can see in lattice also compute the heavy quark diffusion coefficients and as you can see in the lattice calculation there are lot uncertainty as a large error bar and also lattice calculation will give us the information only on temperature dependence certainly not on momentum dependence so people built different model to understand both this observable simultaneously and at the end of the day whatever the transport coefficient they used to com compare their result with experimental data at the end of the day they compare transport coefficient with the with the lattice data at p tends to 0 so this is what the current comparison i will come discuss more later so to understand the heavy quark puzzle the array v2 puzzle it will be really interesting to know how both these observable variable develop with time so if we look at the nuclear suppression factor as you can see the nuclear suppression factor it is such it is really very sensitive to the early stage of the heavy ion collision where the energy density is really very high so scattering takes place at a higher rate that's why within only one for me almost 50% of the suppression develop so as we can see within 3 4 for me it almost get saturated as soon as the radial flow will develop but so the nuclear suppression factor is more sensitive to initial stage of the heavy ion collision whereas the v2 as we can see it is more sensitive to what happened near quark hadron transition temperature to the latter stage of the evolution as we can see in the first one for me a very little v2 is developed this is because initially the bulk does not have any v2 first the bulk will develop its own v2 then only it can transfer to the heavy quark so as you can see the heavy quark v2 is mainly developed in the latter stage mainly 2 to 4 for me or 5 for me depending upon the temperature dependence of the interaction so this give us a hint probably to understand this simultaneous description of both these observable may be more sensitive to the transport coefficient because ra is more sensitive to what happened at the initial stage and v2 is more sensitive to what happened at the latter stage near quark hadron transition temperature probably temperature dependence of the transport coefficient may provide some hint so considering this we consider three different temperature dependence of the transport coefficient to study simultaneously both the ra and the v2 so in the first case we consider where the drag coefficient is approximately constant this is because this is the feature within the quasi particle model as we know quasi particle model is fit the lattice qcd energy density and pressure and get a coupling constant which enhance the interaction near the quark hadron transition temperature so here the coupling the drag coefficient is almost constant so similar that is also something within the phst model as well as the texas t matrix so at the track coefficient temperature dependence is very mild we can tell almost a constant in another model we consider a drag coefficient proportional to temperature is something one can expect in a pqcd with a running coupling constant in another case we consider a drag coefficient which is proportional to the square of the temperature this is something which is one can get from the adhcft 
as well as from PQCD with a constant form. So here we consider three cases, and this is almost cover many of these model people use you within the community. So here our strategy is that within these three model, we'll try to describe arrays and try to have the same array and see how the view will develop depending upon different temperature dependence of the interaction. So this is the rescale drag coefficient, so that we can almost reproduce the same array within all these three cases. So as you can see, for the same array, the V2 is quite different depending upon the temperature dependence of the interactions and more interaction your one hadron transition temperature, more will be the V2 for the same array. So this case, we need to beyond the PQCD and non-perturbative effects are really important for a simultaneous descriptions of the both the charges. So in the same line, there is another based on same the sequencing parameter enhanced near quark hadron transition temperature due to the suppression of the electric skinning mass and other non-perturbative effect. As we can see the comparison, where in comparison with PQCD, this enhanced a lot in the near the quark hadron transition temperatures. So that's in a simultaneous descriptions of this hard proof array and V2, as you can see from this plot. So in the same line, the Texas T matrix, the Ralph Ralph group, the, they also due to the non-perturbative effect, the transport coefficient, mainly the drag coefficients enhance due to the non-perturbative effect near the quark hadron transition temperatures. And it almost become flat or very weak temperature dependence. Of course, at very high temperature, it's recovered the usual the usual PQCD results, and recently they have also uh, extended their model. They have also computed the radiative loss within this T matrix approach and large suppression due to the thermal mass they observe, and of course, the impact on observable are able to be seen. So, then another model, the Bayesian model to data analysis of this DU group, group Stephen Bass, they simultaneously calibrate all the model parameter through model to data comparison and try to extract the possible distributions of all parameter which best describe the data. So as we can see what they are doing, they are parameterizing the jet quenching parameter in terms of the QCD jet quenching parameter along with some parameter with the temperature dependence as well as the momentum dependence, momentum dependence, and they have five parameter. So it is a five dimensional parameter space and they try to simultaneously calibrate all these five model parameters through model to data comparison and try to extract these five parameters, which will give a best fit simultaneously both the array as well as NP2. So as we can see, here is their result on uh, jet quenching. As we can see here also again, the jet quenching parameter near the transition temperature enhance due to enhance in comparison with the PQCD results. And of course, at, at a very high temperature, they reach the usual PQCD results. So here, to describe the data simultaneously. Also, another model from this LBNL and CCNU group, they have also extended their model, both including the radiative loss as well as polygonal. And they have also implemented non-perturbative effect through temperature and momentum dependence a factor within a transport approach. As you can see, this how they parameterize their momentum dependence of their uh, transport coefficients, which is something similar to the feature in already in the T matrix approach. And this is how they parameterize their temperature dependence of the transport coefficients, and which is something similar to what is in the quasi particle model or PhD or the P matrix approach. Of course, at very high temperature as well as high momentum, they also recover the as usual PQCD, they come to the PQCD domain. But at a low temperature, it is indeed different from the PQCD and this really enhance their temperature as well as momentum dependence of the transport coefficient due to which they can able to explain both these observable quite reasonably. And similarly, the PHST model of this Frankfurt group, they also using a quasi particle model, which also enhance the heavy quark and the QGP interaction near the quark hadron transition temperature. 
then they can also able to explain both these objects simultaneously. And recently, there is another model based on heavy quark transport coefficient computed within Polyakov loop, showing similarity and a pre-dependence of the heavy quark transport coefficients, like the T-matrix quasi-particle as well as PHST model, where in this case also, at a low temperature, their interaction enhance due to the suppression of the electric scaling mass. So as we can see in all these few model I discuss, they try to include in different possible way the non-perturbative effect. So, but at the end, the conclusion is almost very similar. In all the, the message is clear. The message is that for a simultaneous descriptions of both these observable, we need to include the non-perturbative effect and this non-perturbative effect, effect enhanced the heavy quark and the QGT interaction at the quark hadron transition temperatures. That is the main features. And at the end, this is the latest comparison of all different phenomenological models done by different group with the lattice QCD data at the end. And within this transport coefficient, they can able to explain the experimental object. So as we can see, all these different models are still within the uncertainty in the error path, but still there is a huge uncertainty. And there are recently, very recently, this last month, there are uh, two papers from the lucky side. Certainly this will provide further gui guideline to constrain heavy quark transport coefficient in UGT. Still, to understand this uncertainty coming from different models, now there are two collaborations going on to understand different parameters much better and try to compare uh, the code in between different groups to understand uh, why we are getting such a uncertainty and what is the possible reason. And the first one is within this EMMI rapid reaction tax force. Uh, this really being some of the theory group as well as experimentalists to try to understand the heavy quark transport coefficient and to extract the possible heavy quark transport coefficients. As you can see in this model, there are five different cases. They compare the heavy quark transport coefficient, the drag coefficient. So as we can see in all among, excluding the PQCD in all other four cases, we can really able to explain, they can able to explain the experimental data within the error path. But still, as we can see, there is a huge uncertainty, more than factor two or 2.5. This is because it not all, the heavy quark transport coefficient is not the only parameter. There are many other from bulk evolution side, from hydronization, hydronic rescattering, and the way they implement, there are many things. So they're trying to understand it better. And there is, sorry, there is another, collaboration that is the jet heavy quark here some of the theory group they are comparing their model but within a static box so as you can see within a static box where they try to fix the ra 0.3 at a momentum around 15 gv and this is the uncertainty within different this is because some people use only collagenal, some people use collagenal plus radiative, some people use a constant, co constant coupling, some people use running couplings, and the scale is also different. Sometimes it run with the temperature, sometimes with the momentum, and some case people also use Lanzgren dynamics, some case Boltzmann dy dynamics, sometimes the cross sections are forward peak, sometimes it is isotropic, indeed long. So now several, yes, it's going on to understand much better and how different group can really converge and extract the heavy quark transport coefficient. So in between, there are also some other new observable and recently the one of them is the event by event, light quark, heavy quark, event by event correlation. That is the BN BN correlations, light quark and heavy quark and the correlation coefficients which is really, really very sensitive to heavy quark transport coefficient. As we can see, here is the transport coefficient, the drag coefficient computed in two models. One is in PQCD with the running coupling, another case in quasi particle. And this temperature dependence is reflected clearly in the linear correlation coefficients. So if this will be observed in experiment in future, certainly it will also help to constrain the heavy quark transport coefficient. And in the meantime, system side scan of Dimajan is also another interesting issue because this will provide us hint about the origin of V2 from small system. As we can see, they have studied the RAA V2 for this different system. So as we can see in case of RAA, as we will reduce 
the system size the separation decrease for uh, both the centrality but if we look at the v2 it is almost independent of the system size does not matter which system it is the v2 is almost constant this is because here there is a competition between system size and eccentricity for a smaller system the eccentricity is in large which indeed compensate the small size at the end of the day the v2 is almost similar so if this will observe in experimentally certainly it will help to understand the origin of the two in small system so apart from the some another there are some other interesting issue so that is the time evolution part in this community people use different uh, model sorry different evolution equation or transport equation to study the heavy quark dynamics some people use langevin equation some people use boltzmann equation some people use model based on energy loss so as we know this langevin equation is approximation of the boltzmann equation on the small momentum transfer so at a weak energy maybe the momentum transfer is small but at lsc it might not be so that might also lead to some uncertainty so to compare this what we did we compare both this langevin and boltzmann equation under an identical environment so that means we solve starting from the same matrix element and starting from a delta function at a momentum 10 g so as we can see in case of the langevin the evolution is always a gaussian as expected because langevin is nothing this is just the shift of the average momentum with a fluctuation error that's why it's always look a gaussian But if we we'll see the Boltzmann case, this is not at all a Gaussian, rather a long tail at the low momentum. So this indicates the charm quark does not follow Brownian motions. Brownian motions, at least at a 10 GV. And if we we'll go to very low momentum, say 2 GV, 3 GV, then certainly it will, but certainly not at a 10 GV. So then we extend the same calculation for what? so as we can see here in bottom quark also we did the same calculation starting from a delta function from 10 gv as we can see in case of bottom quark all quark the boltzmann case also it is like a gas so this indicates bottom quark follow the brownian motion whereas charm quark not so here there is another scale that is m by t if m by t will be large then brownian motion is a good approximation otherwise not so here we have compared uh, the langevin dynamics so here we have compared the result we obtained or the spectra we obtained from langevin and boltzmann taking a ratio say this ratio is 1 then indeed boltzmann and langevin giving the same results if not then certainly they are deviating so as we can see for a very large value of m by t so indeed the ratio is 1 that's what swell but as soon as you will decrease the m by t ratio they deviate from one for pqcd the deviation is about 15% probability is indeed yeah, a good approximation whereas if you look the quasi particle model this is indeed the, the difference will be about 30 to 35% this is because in a quasi particle model the scattering is isotropic that's why langevin dynamics overestimate the interactions and another thing is that even if within both this langevin and boltzmann we try to reproduce the similar uh, array in case of boltzmann the v2 will be more this is because in boltzmann the evolution is slow to reproduce the same array as of the langevin dynamics so then there is another issue that is the another interesting issue that is the heavy quark hat for the hadronization people also use different model some group use only a vacuum fragmentation some group use in medium fragmentation and some group use coalescence model. so as you know this heavy quark fragmentation function is very hard the vacuum fragmentation at least in proton proton collision where the peak is around 0.9 so as so as we can see probably this is where the uncertainty is maximum so here is a plot from the recent uh, rapid reaction task force uh, discussion where uh, we compare different models so as we can see the level of uncertainty coming from the hadronization scenario so here we have just take a ratio between the charm quark to d major 
just after the hydronization to see what is the uh, uh, value, uh, what is the difference different people groups are getting if we compute this HAA, where it itself the difference is probably a factor two to oh, three about. But before 2007, people only talk about the D major, not the this variant to major ratio is also another interesting observable. Now, in experiment, they also observe uh, this variant to major ratio enhancement. But before 2007, what usually different group used to do? They convert all their damage charm quark to D major. So that's why they used to get a large enhancement in the low momentum part. But after this 2007, this variant to major ratio, which is about one. So if you, one will include consistently this uh, lambda C also, then as we can see, there is a huge difference in the nuclear substation factor as well. Because array of the D major degrees, because part of the charm quark make coalescence in coalescence and they form the, uh, the lambda C. So they're not all these charm square, they are hydronized to D major, rather some of them also hydronized to lambda C. That's why it is suppressed. So to study this array, one also array as well as V2, one need to consider uh, all this hadron. That means they need to implement it at all hadron the possibility, what, are, what is the probability to all hadron, at least lambda C as well as DS as well as all other possible. Comparison. And this is the latest results from the star um, star in comparison with the different theoretical model. So as we can see, the experimental data support a coalescence plus a fragmentation model. And this baryon to measure ratio is very important. And this have the potential to disentangle different hydronization mechanisms. Because this baryon is a three-body problem, whereas major is a two-body. So their hydronization mechanism are quite different. They are really sensitive, whether it is a coalescence or fragmentation. So, an experimental data support a baryon to major ratio. And there are two latest development. One in the recent calculation, they have a implemented the probability of coalescence at p tends to zero is one to all hadron. And including many other resonances and to constrain the radius of the division from the experimental side. And there are uh, also another development in these directions uh, by the Texas group where they have now uh, in, they have now extended their model for baryon within the resonance recombination model where uh, they have included more resonances, which are not even in the particle data book, rather they are predicted in the relativistic quark model and consistent with the lattice QCD data. And within this, they can able to describe, give a good descriptions to not only the array of division, also, also the DS as well as prediction for the lambda C, and they can also reasonably explain the variant to measure ratio. <laughs> then there is another Another interesting thing, and the last uh, few minutes, I will discuss a bit about the initial stage effect, mainly coming from the magnetic field, angular momentum, as well as the plasma. So as we know, in non-central collision, there is a strong magnetic field to produce, and which, of course, decay very fast. We believe if there is a magnetic field, if any, then it should be the heavy quark, which will witness the peak of the magnetic field. So then what we did, we tried to study the impact of the electromagnetic field on the heavy quark dynamics at LAC. So what we did, we tried to solve the Langevin equation in the presence of an external force. We include this extra term, that is the external force, indeed the Lorentz force. Then we compute this directed flow of the heavy quark. Then we find there is a strong splitting that was more than a factor hundred times larger than the light one, light quark V1. So then we try to understand why this V2 is such large. Then what we did, we try to put by force a thermalization on heavy quark by increasing the interaction by hand, as we can see. So as we we'll keep on increasing the interaction of heavy quark with the bulk, the V1 will decrease. And at the end, it will, of course, give something similar to edge of the light quark. So mainly what happened, 
being a non equilibrium probe this heavy quark remember the initial heat it get from the magnetic field and that's why we are getting a strong directed flow and as we can see here the directed flow is just opposite for charm and anti anti charm this is mainly due to their opposite charge so indeed it is a splitting so as you can see now recently alis collaboration has measured this heavy quark directed flow as well as the splitting as we can see they also observe a very strong splitting and which is about to a very large factor probably 100 even 1000 times larger than the uh, light quark splitting so this indeed we provide the a good opportunity to study and characterize the electromagnetic field through this heavy quark directed flow so apart from this heavy quark directed flow there is another interesting thing is the tilted initial distribution so as you know when two nucleus collide so they have the angular momentum and they will transfer a fraction of the angular momentum to the qgp medium due to which the initial matter distribution will be tilted this is in fact the forward backward asymmetry the tilted distribution not symmetry forward backward asymmetry but this heavy quark being a hard probe they are produced at the very early stage so they are in this symmetry in a rapidity so what happen due to the interaction between the heavy quark and the tilted bulk this the bulk will drag the heavy quarks so as a result this there will be a strong directed flow for the heavy quark in comparison with the light quark maybe initially in this paper they predicted it is about a factor 45 times larger than the light quark and recently star collaboration observed both this average directed flow as well as the splitting so as you can see uh, there is a strong there is a huge difference between the directed flow of a light quark and heavy quark and here also they have shown the ratio which is probably a factor of maybe 40 50 or so so indeed uh, through this heavy quark directed flow one can really understand the matter distributions producing the high energy heavy ion collisions uh, this is the average directed flow so average directed flow means it is just uh, add both this d as well as d bar and d by 2 and compare with the sum of the theoretical ratios and this is delta v1 means this is the splitting so this is indeed the splitting is mainly due to the electromagnetic field as i discussed in the last slide so as you can see there are large error bar so star collaboration at least did not conclude anything on electromagnetic field whereas in alice collaboration they have really given there is a huge splitting in alice collaboration and here there is another recent calculations Uh, they, they they have considered both the electromagnetic field as well as the tilted distributions and uh, within a, a transport approach where they can uh, describe both the ra v1 barrier to meson ratio as well as v3 and they, they have also uh, explain both this trial result quite consistently within the error bar and of course there are some issue with the huge splitting at alice result uh, one need to still understand why the splitting is such a high and probably there is something missing also there and probably the transport coefficient in magnetic field because they just consider the bulk side what is the effect from electromagnetic field and there are several com calculation going on around the probe to compute the heavy quark transport coefficient so then in the last few minute i will mainly discuss about to the heavy part a small system mainly proving the plasma phase using heavy quark as a probe so as you can see these are the some of the experimental result on small system so as we know in nucleus nucleus collision there is a sub strong suppression so mainly based due to the energy loss and due to the interaction of the light quark with the heavy quark so heavy quark they will lose momentum and the low high pt particle will shifted to the uh, low momentum particles but as you can see in a small system produced due to the collision of proton nucleus instead of there is a uh, suppression it is there is a kind of enhancement in the low momentum of course within the error bar but as we can see there is a very large elliptic flow so what mechanism could build up such a large v2 without any energy loss 
so of course there are some transport calculation in this direction using heavy quark as a group to understand the small system within a transport model but what they observe within a transport model when one go to study a small system they will observe a strong suppression but a very little heat too so that is the issue so considering the problem arising so what we did we just change our transport uh, setup so instead of considering a qgp medium we will consider a plasma so here i would just like to mention in this conference itself we have also two very nice talk on plasma uh, one was on monday another one was on tuesday where the in the monday talk they discuss about the jet quenching in plasma and on the tuesday talk they also discuss about the heavy quark momentum diffusion in plasma so in this setup what we did instead of considering a qgp medium we consider a plasma the strong color electric and magnetic chromoelectric and magnetic field and to study the heavy quark momentum evolution instead of uh, the langevin equation here we are solving the wang equation so we have just change our setup so here we consider instead of a plasma to plasma and for the momentum evolution we are using the wang equation to study the momentum so as we can see when we compute the nuclear suppression factor so what we observe so when we compute the nuclear suppression factor taking the ratio between the initial final to initial spectra what we observe we observe a enhancement instead of a suppression that means we observe some of the low momentum particles are shifted to the high momentum so initially we thought as if it is a cathode tube effect so this heavy quarks are get accelerated due to the color electric field but when we did a simulation starting from the delta function within a plasma as you can see in this plot uh, at a different momentum a delta function then we observe what happened so during the evolution the width of the distribution only increase the peak remain almost the same so this indicates it's indeed the diffusion not the cathode dipped the tube because it is not getting a direct not a directional because it's random uh, so that's why it is indeed the diffusion of the heavy quark uh, in plasma so then we extend the same model to nucleus nucleus collision where we compute the nuclear suppression factor in the pre equilibrium phase for a very short time say 0.2 for me 3 for me and 4 for me using a different uh, saturation scale to understand it so as you can see in the gold gold case there is a strong enhancement in comparison to small system in proton lake then we try to extract the heavy quark diffusion coefficient Uh, here it is the variance we try to extract the variance uh, at a different time as we can see the variance is increasing linear linearly with the time so this indicates heavy quarks are uh, out of equilibrium but in our calculation there is no energy loss just to include the energy loss what we did we try to include it within uh, the fluctuation dissipation theorem that means we add a, another term in the wang equation just to just to include the energy loss within the fluctuation dissipation theorem and we observe when even if when we will include the energy loss within a fluctuation dissipation theorem the impact of energy loss are really marginal this is because here the effective temperature is really very high and when the effective temperature will be very high the system will be indeed diffusion dominated that's why the impact of the drag coefficient is mild at very early stage of course as soon as the temperature will decrease you will reach the qgp phase then suddenly the energy loss part will be much we play a very strong important role to generate the nuclear suppression factor as of the next day so then what we did we include this plasma phase as a initial condition uh, to the nucleus nucleus collision as a pre equilibrium phase to study the heavy quark array and the two so as we can see here earlier what people used to do to model the pre equilibrium phase they use a free streaming approach 
So here we consider three different initial condition. Once we consider a free streaming up to 0.3. In another case, we consider a plasma phase from 0.1 to 0.3 for me. In another case, we consider an early thermalization for, from 0.1 for me instead of a plasma or a free streaming. Then we try to reproduce the same array within the same model. Then as we can see for the plasma phase, when we include the plasma, the V2 will be much more in comparison to free streaming and other case. This is because due to the plasma phase, initially there will be an enhancement. Then to reproduce the same interaction, we need to have a more interaction of the heavy quark with the QGP to reproduce the same nuclear separation factor. And this will result a, a large V2. And indeed, it will also helpful to describe both the nuclear separation factor as well as a V2 simultaneously. So apart from this, there are uh, some other interesting work in this direction as well. Uh, so we already have two talks in this direction. They already discuss uh, the heavy quark dynamics in plasma, the diffusion coefficient, as well as the jet quenching parameter. So there are some other work also within the kinetic theory. They also observe the impact of the free equilibrium phase is very significant and it will really alter the dynamics of RA and V2 to understand the heavy quark dynamics in future. Then finally, the conclusions and perspective. So certainly there are several improvements in the last few years. So in terms of uh, the heavy quark transport coefficient to understand its temperature dependence, as well as the momentum dependence and, getting, and to constrain the experiment to, the, to understand the heavy quark puzzle. Then people compare their transport coefficients with the lattice QCD result. And uh, we need certainly more precise data and new observable, say on uh, VNVN correlation, heavy and light, then uh, experimental data on lambda C, then DD bar correlations, system size scan, and more importantly, bottom quark observable, which will certainly give us a significant advantage to understand the hot QCD matter. And this V1 is a very important probe to understand the electromagnetic field as well as the angular momentum. And recently, there are several work by different group uh, to prove the pre-equilibrium phase by the heavy quark, that is the plasma phase. So this is indeed the interesting, and almost all the group observe this pre-equilibrium phase is really very important, and this will really helpful to understand the heavy quark dynamics in a QCT matter. So thank you very much for your uh, kind attention. Thanks a lot, uh, Santosh, for this very nice talk. And we already have a few questions. So over to Sir. Yeah, hey, thanks. Thanks yeah. for this very nice talk. Um, so I was wondering, so you showed a few, a few of these calculations of RAA, right? Some of them extending out to fairly high momenta. And um, I mean, for, from what you discussed, you discussed a lot about drag and diffusion, so effects of elastic processes. Um, I'm wondering um, to what extent uh, inelastics or radiation essentially has to be taken into account there. And I would naively expect that the higher you go in momenta, the somehow the more important that also gets and whether this is done or why it is negligible. Yes, certainly. And uh, yes, I mainly consider about this the elastic collision. This is because all these people compute the RA and V2, they mainly constrain, mainly stay up to very low momentum, say 6, 7 GV. And certainly if we go beyond that, then this radiative process are, will be very important. And, it is, and another thing also, some of the people use the quasi-particle model. And this quasi-particle model, this gluon is massive. Their mass is about 1 GV. So due to this thermal gluon mass, this gluon radiation will suppress at least in the low momentum domain. And recently within this T-matrix approach, the Texas, Texas group extended their model and uh, they also observed due to this large thermal mass at a low momentum. But of course, uh, beyond 5 GD, sorry, 5 GD momentum, certainly radiative process will be interesting. And some group have already uh, 
factory including this radiation within their model right because i mean i mean because if you, if you look at somehow you know this all these are i mean in particular the ia also right i mean then it's about the, the part where you had the sensitivity, say, for instance, on the time depends or so forth. That's mainly at high momentum, right? Uh, yes, some of the group like PHHD and other, they include, they, they should not do this. It is their prerogative. So, yes, I agree with you completely. When someone not including radiative, probably they should not go beyond 10 GV. Uh, even if they, they are considering a thermal gluon, which is one GV, still they should not go much uh, large momentum. But some of the group who say DC, LD, NL, CCNU, they have included radiation and they are going to high momentum. I can okay, show. I see. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. Okay, yes, yes, I can show. So this is the, as you can see, they have included the gluon radiation, um, but not many other group. Those are, Okay, thanks. Okay. Yeah, the next question is by Ayan. And please. Yes, hello, sure. Sandesh. Thanks for the very nice talk. Oh, hello, hi. Hi. Thanks for the hi. very nice talk. <laughs> okay, so I wanted to ask something uh, simple. So you said about this heavy light, uh, even by even cor correlation. Is, is, is only sensitive, is very sensitive to this heavy quark transport coefficient. Is it because some systematic uncertainties cancel out or what is the reason why it is, why this particular thing is so sensitive? Because this is, as I mentioned also earlier, so the temperature dependence of the transport coefficients are uh, really very key to how the RA V2 dynamics. So RA is really more sensitive to the early stage and V2 is more really sensitive what happened in near the quark hadron transition temperature, transition temperature. So this temperature dependence, as we can see, in one case, the temperature interaction is in PQCD case, the interaction is strong near the early stage, whereas in quasi particle model, the interaction is much stronger near quark hadron transition temperature. You put this different uh, domain uh, where which is dominant, depending upon that, this heavy light correlation coefficient is sensitive. Because as we can see also in this earlier plot, uh, this VNVN correlation coefficients are really very yes, strongly correlated, and they are really sensitive to the temperature dependence. Ah, I see. Okay. Uh, so I have a, another very clarification question about your plasma model. Uh, where you have modeling the force by a Wong uh, equation and you are put in a drag term by hand, but then you say that this drag coefficient depends, uh, is computed from fluctuation dissipation. But how do you really apply fluctuation dissipation in the plasma? Oh, yes, I on, yes. Well, although I understand plasma, it is not really equilibrium. That's what probably you mean. So e, yeah. yes, what? Yes, in plasma we have a so there we compute the effective temperature considering a spinning mass of gluon. So once we know what is the temperature, which is of course very high in comparison to the QGP temperature, it is close to 1.5 GV, say, sorry, 1.5, yes, it's very high. So once we know the effective temperature, then uh, we, we know already the diffusion coefficient, then the drag coefficient we extract from the fluctuation dissipation theorem and implement. And I agree that this is not a very rigorous way. This is almost a fast calculation and we just try to see really. And if we see the fluctuation dissipation theorem, if our temperature will be really very high, then does not matter what is the drag coefficient. So it will anyway diffusion dominated. But to make things more consistent, recently we are really including the uh, back reaction, uh, which really the quark side, how it will impact and if really radiation is. Now we are moving in that direction, but this is something yes. We... Okay, thank you. Is it clear? Uh, yeah, okay, you answered, but okay. Yeah, please go ahead. I, please. Had a, uh, I had a small question. So when you mention uh, V2 as uh, an final state effect, but from your last uh, discussion, it seems like 
uh, V2 can also have effects from the initial stages, right? Especially uh, from the glasma stage. Oh, yes, yes. V2, G2, yes, glasma stage will affect. So, could you please tell exactly what you are asking? I am not getting it properly. Uh, initially, uh, you are mentioning that V2 may be a initial state effect, but uh, it seems like the glasma state may also affect your V2, right? Exactly, exactly. So now we are also going to compute the V2, V2 and V1 from the plasma phase. The initial state, it the magnetic field, V1, all this also, plasma field will also affect the initial V1, so V1, V2, all these. Now we are moving in that direction and we will compute of course all this. How much is the. Okay. Sorry. So, how much is the effect like uh, from the uh, initial state versus uh, the effect on V2 from the hydronization of the final state? Oh, yes, yes. Because, uh, as you mentioned, yes, because the charm quark, if we say at a weak energy, 40% uh, it gets uh, due to the interaction medium as well as the initial. All these things and another percent to forty percent from hydronization because a heavy quark V2 have two component. One it get from the light quark due to hydronization at a rig that is about to say thirty to thirty five percent and remaining sixty five to seventy due to the initial stage as well as interaction. But LSE it is a bit different. But uh, at LSE the impact of uh, hydronization is they are probably twenty to twenty five percent hydronization and remaining. From the initial stage the interaction with the bulb. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, there's a question by Ashutosh Dar. Sure. Uh, hi. Uh, nice hello. talk. Hello. Hi. Uh, so, I had a question about this uh, V1 splitting. So, yeah. can you comment about how the, uh, how it behaves uh, with impact parameter? I mean, since uh, we know that magnetic field changes with the impact parameter, it grows and then and then it decays. I mean, it goes down. So, do you see the same trend in V1? Yes, indeed, indeed, it's a good question. So you see, if the impact factor will zero, then there will be no magnetic field at all. It will do a real central collision because that's, there will be no spectra, right. no magnetic field. Like this thing, it will indeed zero. And uh, yes, it is strongly depends on the impact parameter and one need to compute it for uh, each impact uh, parameter. That's why I mentioned for a non-central collision indeed. And then one need to couple this Langevin dynamics with the uh, Maxwell's equation to compute all these things consistently. But indeed, yes, it's depend, but uh, uh, really much, uh, not much calculation has been done in this direction. So as I you know, you can see that a recent paper uh, from uh, Vincenzo Greco, Salvatore Plumari, they probably try to go beyond some other. Otherwise, mainly people compute this in this range. So certainly one should do do a calculation and check how it is sensitive all this time. Yeah, so the next question is by uh, Yao Yang. Please go ahead. Sure, please. For me? Uh, just, a, just a comment, I mean, the simultaneous description of the uh, RPA and V2 is also apparently to be problematic also for the hidden heavy field, right, for Coconia. And there are uh, several studies uh, on that Bring that to the, also the uh, initial production of the V2 could be very important, aside from the final state interaction. Just a comment. Okay, okay, sure, sure, sure. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, I see no further questions for now. Maybe if there are further questions, one can uh, send it to the speaker directly or can write in the chat box so that we can convey it to him. And thanks again, Santosh, for this very 